Okay, we're live. This is Jay Fidel, Think Tech Energy 808, the cutting edge, here on a given Monday. And guess what? We have Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar and Hilo joining us by phone. Hi, Marco. Smile and say hi. Smiling and say hi, Jay. Hi, um, my smile just goes off the screen because uh, the joy and pure pleasure I have of speaking to you is just immeasurable. So thank you so much for having me back on. Okay, all right. Nice to be with you. So the title of our show is Coal and Solar in Our Stocking, and the subtitle is But for What Christmas? So let's, <laughs> let's answer those questions one by one. What do you mean coal and solar in our stocking? Do we have it now? Um, do we gonna, are we going to get it later? Um, what's, what do you mean by stocking? That is futuresque because we're, we're not at Christmas now. You're right, but we try to live with Christmas uh, and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and all sorts of other good holidays in our heart year-round, right? Uh-huh. So what got me thinking about coal and solar, well, let's, let's look at coal to begin with. There was um, a piece in the Hawaii Business Magazine uh, on the coal-powered, uh, the one and only coal-powered uh, power plant coal-fired power plant here in the state, which is on Oahu, mm -hmm. and it is owned and operated by AES, which is a mainland uh, multinational corporation in the energy field, and that power plant is scheduled to um, be decommissioned, or at least stop using coal, no later than 2022. And the, the question has been, uh, what comes next, if anything? Uh, is some type of alternate fuel source possible? Uh, there was uh, apparently an attempt at the legislature this past session that would have um, codified or made it uh, official policy law that this plant would definitively go, uh, go away and not, not produce power anymore, at least using coal. But apparently Hawaiian Electric wants to not necessarily completely eliminate that possibility to continue to burn coal there. And uh, I, I couldn't disagree more with uh, any possibility uh, or likelihood of that power plant uh, continuing to burn coal in any way, shape, or form under any conditions. Uh, from what I understand, that plant uh, produces more pollution than any other facility in the entire state of Hawaii, even compared to much bigger oil burning power plants uh, on Oahu. and we can and must do better than burning coal uh, on this uh, on the island of Oahu and on uh, in the state in general. And what also goes uh, goes uh, along with this is that the largest power plant on Maui uh, for Miko territory is the power plant of Maalaya, which is 212 megawatts. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is also scheduled to go down for good. Uh, by 2024, and I know that this commission of uh, Jay Griffin, Jenny Potter, Leo Asuncio, uh, it is my belief that they are firmly committed to seeing both AES uh, go offline for good by no later than 2022 and Maalaya go offline for good no later than 2024. So the big question to me, one of the big questions is what do you do? What is Hawaiian Electric on Oahu and Maui Electric on Maui? What do they do to to replace that firm generation, that backbone generation. And that's where things get uh, gets much more challenging. And you know, my position, at the risk of coming across a little bit hard and hard on uh, Hawaiian Electric is that they've had uh, years, if not a decade or more, to plan for the retirement of these power plants. And uh, I believe that there is concern, uh, at least I'm concerned, in terms of what comes next, because all this solar stuff uh, utility scale solar and storage, which uh, there's a new RFP that's been issued for hundreds and hundreds of megawatts of solar and hundreds and hundreds of megawatt hours of, of storage, that that is two, three, five years away. So what do we do in the meantime? And uh, there's, uh, there's this concern in terms of what's going to produce that, uh, that necessary kind of base load power generation once uh, when, say, the AES plant goes offline of 180 megawatts and the Ma'alaya plant on Maui, which is 212 megawatts. So, you know, we're, we're entering into, uh, seems like we're always entering into uncharted waters, Jay, when it comes to 
what the energy mix is going to be in the near term for our islands and also what it's going to be in the longer term. But uh, renewables in terms of meeting the renewable portfolio standards, which were mandated by law back in 2015 and committed to by all the parties back in the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative 11 years ago, uh, there's a ways to go especially HECO on, on Oahu. I mean, just to, to briefly go over the, the numbers, I mean, they were supposed to hit 30% renewable by next year, 30% by 2020. And as of last year, according to Hawaiian Electric's own data, HECO was at 22%, which obviously is considerably lower than 30%. Now they do a, a cumulative tri-company average uh, to report to the commission, but uh, last year they hit 27%, actually a little bit less than. 2017 they were at 27%, 2016 they were at 26%, 2015 they were at 23%. So the long and the short of it is Hawaiian Electric, as they try companies, uh, I think are, are challenged right now in terms of hitting. They will not hit, I'll just go out on a limb, they will not hit 30% by next year, most likely. So, you know, so what? You know, does that mean anything? Whereas KIUC on Kauai will be somewhere over 50, most likely, by the end of this year. So I've said a lot. I will shut up and uh, please invite your response. Well, let me, let me just unpack a little of that. So Ma'alaya is coal also? No, Ma'alaya is oil, oil-based. The only coal plant in the whole state is uh, the one at AES uh, uh, on Oahu. Okay, and you said that um, AES, I mean, I know that AES is a big, big energy company, very deep pocket, and they do renewables, among other things. It's interesting, you know, that they're into coal and also renewables. But why, why can't Hawaiian Electric or somebody say, uh, look, you know, we're, we're not going to uh, extend or renew your coal contract at Kapolei, um, why don't you do something else and we'll entertain that? Why don't you do something renewable and we'll entertain that? Why don't you, you know, help us out in our renewable goals? Um, wouldn't that be, you know, an, an easy solution? I mean, you got, you got a deep pocket investment source here uh, who is interested in Hawaii. Um, why can't they just move over to a, a better uh, resource? Uh, has that been discussed? Well, apparently, it uh, was brought to my attention, in fact, just over the weekend, that uh, AES either is doing or is looking into using a uh, fuel substitute in the form of wood pellets, wood pellets to, uh, in lieu of, let's say, burning coal to create heat and running turbines. Uh, and one can say, well, wood pellets, I mean, especially if the wood is recycled, right, if it comes from waste and it's not virgin forests that are being chopped down, obviously, that's a preferable power source to, to coal. And on one level, you know, I buy that argument, but I have evolved to a point in, in my thinking, in my view, that we cannot, uh, those of us living in the state, and also as a species, we just cannot abide by any type of new power generation, at least in our state, that comes in the form of combusting any type of hydrocarbon material. I'm, I'm just, I cross the Rubicon, Jay, in terms of we have to, we must do better in terms of new power generation than burning stuff. Well, the other thing that comes to mind, I mean, I agree that burning wood is still going to give you carbon emissions. It's a fossil fuel. That, that's not a, a step forward to renewables. Sorry. Uh, so that doesn't sound like a great idea to start burning wood. Um, you know, you, but you know, there's a policy point here that I'd like to inquire with you about, and that is, you mentioned that there was a bill in the legislature last year that would have um, forced the termination of the coal plant at the end of the contract in 2022. Um, but is the legislature the right body to determine that kind of issue? Is the legislature the right policy and implementation organization to determine the short strokes on how we deal plant by plant, facility by facility? Um, shouldn't that be coming from somewhere else, an energy office, for example? I know that the energy office hasn't done much here, uh, or, or possibly uh, the PUC itself, which as you said, has, has expressed a view about this. Why don't we have the PUC why doesn't the PUC step in and say no more 
coal. We're not going to permit it. And we're going to issue a decision and order on some, um, you know, some, some uh, case or other uh, that, that stops that. Uh, hasn't that been discussed? It seems to me that having the legislature deal by statute and by, you know, people who may not be experts in the subject, uh, on, on policy around, around the source of energy in the state is really not the right way to do it. Well, uh, you know, I happen to believe that this commission effectively will do as I think we both want it to do, Jay, but I don't necessarily fault the legislature for trying to, uh, trying to get on the right train, so to speak. Uh, this uh, House Bill 563, which is, was uh, in play this past session, was passed by two House committees, but never got a vote in either the full House or Senate. The bill would have prohibited, quote, air permits for coal-burning electricity generation facilities and the approval of new power purchase agreements for electricity generated from coal, close quotes. In other words, all Hawaii electric utilities and their contractors would have been prohibited from using power plants that run exclusively on coal after the AES site retires in 20. 22, and I don't find that by any stretch, uh, any type of overstretch on the part of the ledge to say no more coal in this state. Oh, I yeah, that's because, you know, you and I both agree with that bill. However, uh, and that was a Henry Kurnis life of the land bill, wasn't it? I, um, however, I, I would like to add this, though, that the legislature is sometimes very slow, and it operates out of political motivations, sometimes out of personal biases and, and personal arguments. Um, and if you want to count on the legislature to do uh, energy, you know, energy policy with alacrity, don't. It doesn't work that way. And we need alacrity. I mean, climate change is coming. Um, and our deadlines are coming. Uh, to rely on them, you know, I mean, even the bill that, that was supposed to allow for storage, um, storage credits, you know, has been languishing for what, three years or more? Um, you know, who's to say what's going to happen in the, in the, uh, the machinations of the, of the 2020 legislature on, on this, uh, on this action to, isn't it, isn't it better to, to simply have the PUC, which is three people, um, and a docket and maybe a hearing um, act on it? They could, they could be a lot quicker and they would not get stuck in the kind of politics um, that the legislature, we need we need an organization, whether it's the PUC, the energy office, or an energy you know, authority of some kind that, that is able to move quickly on these things, or we'll never get there. No? Uh, I'm not going to disagree with you there, my friend. I mean, I'm, you know, I've been in the energy field in Hawaii now for uh, what, several decades, and I'm surprised... Uh, at how slowly things move sometimes. And I mean, I, I mentioned to you before, my, my first energy conference that I went to, one of the first ones that I went to was uh, back in uh, 1980, 81 at the Sheraton. So I'm dating myself, you know, almost 40 years ago. And yes, indeed we have made progress, but I think there's a you know, more of an urgent uh, imperative to really uh, no longer abide by the uh, uh, foot dragging and excuses and, well, this is the way business is done here. I, I really see much more of a, uh, you know, kind of house on fire. In fact, I'll share with you, I was uh, uh, sitting down not too long ago uh, with uh, one of the HEI directors uh, and this particular person told me several times the course of conversation that the planet is on fire. And uh, you typically don't hear you know, directors of major companies saying stuff like that. But I, I happen to believe uh, that uh, they characterized it exactly right, that I think the planet is on fire and uh, we need more action sooner rather than later and less equivocating and less uh, excuses and chasing tails, chasing our own tails in terms of why things can't be done so soon. So, yeah, I agree. I agree. If, you know, if we have three people at the commission who are making decisions, it's certainly better or likely to lead to a faster, hopefully better outcome than, uh, than House committees and Senate committees and, and the machinations and political uh, game playing that often goes, goes on in the part of legislatures, not just in our state, but also across the country. Yeah, and we need leadership from the, uh, from the governor and the governor's office. 
uh, because it, you know a lot of this uh, either the action or inaction starts there. So I hope the governor is listening. If if he wants things to happen, he wants to take credit for any moves in energy, any improvements in energy. He has to do something. Uh, and right now, I think uh, we're we're in the doldrums, as you point out. So let's look at uh, chart one. You had a very interesting chart that we should take a look at and that you should explain about where the movement is in various, uh, I guess, renewable sources. Yes, in fact, um, this particular graph was provided to me by our uh, my friend and our mutual friend, Ted Peck, former energy director under uh, Governor Linda Lingle. And the, 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 the graph shows the, and I'm waiting to see it on the screen there, but, uh, the graph shows the contribution of um, energy uh, going back to 2007, uh, the, the x-axis being uh, time from 2007 to, to 2018, and the y-axis being a megawatt hours, megawatt hours, which is uh, uh, one megawatt is a, a million watts. And what I find rather striking uh, and, and uh, heartening is that uh, rooftop solar you know, started off at pretty much zero 12 years ago. And uh, now, as of last year, it is producing more megawatt hours than all the other renewable energy sources uh, by far. Uh, and uh, I was just surprised to see that. It shows what uh, rooftop solar, also known as distributed generation, also known as distributed energy resources, that these 80 so thousand rooftop solar systems across our islands, uh, when you add them all up, uh, they are actually producing quite a bit of power. And uh, I find that to be uh, encouraging and uh, we, need to, uh, we need to continue to support rooftop solar. And you know, I'm very concerned, as I've said so many times over the months and years, that uh, rooftop solar is um, is down a lot from its halcyon days of 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. And I, I see distributed energy resources in the form of solar plus batteries to be absolutely critical to going where we need to go as a state as far as uh, distributed energy being a, a positive from multiple perspectives, not least of which is resiliency and the robustness of a grid where we have the potential for uh, having power available, micro-gridding or nano-gridding, in the case of serious disruptions to other parts of the grid. I mean, I don't know what kind of play Hurricanes Eric and Flossie got over the you know, past several weeks over in Oahu, but you know, the Big Island is the first uh, front line, right, in terms of these weather disturbances blasting yeah. in from the eastern Pacific, and that's only, you know, we're at the beginning of the hurricane season, so it's not, like I keep on saying, and I think we both agree, it's not a question of if, but when, one of the islands is going to get hit by a Category 3, 4, or 5 hurricane. So distributed energy resources, rooftop solar, I think is absolutely critical to be able to take us where we need to go, along with centralized solar and storage and centralized wind and storage and so forth. So, that, you know, it, it's got to be a mix. So, yeah, I was heartened to see that rooftop solar was by far uh, the largest contributor in terms of power. Now, what uh, is missing on this graph uh, would be the contribution of oil, the contribution of coal uh, in terms of megawatt hours, and you would need to increase the scale multiple fold because uh, these renewable sources are, are teeny tiny dwarfed by what you know we talked about before, the fact that the state is still 80 plus percent dependent on oil. Uh, for power generation and for our overall energy supply. So, yeah, the solar stuff, uh, you know, looks good, but it's still uh, too small of a, a drop in the bucket of the big ocean of how much energy the state needs. Well, I remember one, uh, one comment uh, in that article in Hawaii Business that you alluded to earlier uh, for the proposition that in the case of extreme weather or other kinds of uh, natural or unnatural disasters, uh, oil is is a is a good way to bridge the gap to recover. Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly why they said that, but that was in the article. Do you have any comment on that? Is oil a better way um, to recover after a disaster? 
I can't really comment on that. I mean, in terms of uh, a way to recover, I'm not really sure what that refers to. That. I guess I'd have to go back and look at it a bit more um, more closely. I mean, oil is uh, is easier to to deal with. It's easier to transport. I think it's 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 certainly cleaner than coal. So, you know, it's. You know, between two what I'll call necessary evils, you know, coal or oil, I'll choose oil any day and uh, of the week and twice on Sunday compared to coal. But uh, yeah, yeah, well, we let me let do. me go let me go to oil for a minute. Okay, oil, you know, the price isn't bad. Although they, what, what's going on in the Strait, uh, Strait of Hormuz may have a secondary effect. The primary effect would be on supplies to Asia. I don't think it's affected global prices um, just yet, but it, it may. Uh, and, you know, oil, oil is going to be available. In fact, uh, other fuels such as LNG are displacing oil in many places, and so oil will be available. Um, now, take that on the one hand. Take it on the other hand that we have, um, we have oil plants in the state of Hawaii uh, that are older than I am, and I'm old. Uh, and what and what's interesting about that um, is that they're not they're not on contracts like the AES coal plant. That's a contract. That's a purchase power agreement that ends in 2022. The the all the oil plants, uh, maybe including Maalaya, are they've been around a long time. They are directly owned and operated by the utility, just as they have been from the beginning. They are the classic model of utility, you know. Um, you know, sort of a, a hub and a spokes uh, out, out to the distributees. Um, so we haven't really gotten, correct me if I'm wrong, but we haven't actually gotten out of those plants. They still work. They're, they're older. Uh, maybe they have mm, greater maintenance issues, but they, they, they're still there. And that's why we're, we're still mostly oil. Um, and th there's no deadline date for each specific plant, plant, such as there would be, you know, by the expiration of the purchase power agreement with AES. Uh, do you agree with my, my distinction there? And what do you think we can do about, about forcing the closure of oil-fired oil plants? It's infinitely easier to in my view, to envision that the AES power plant will be shutting down once and for all for good in several years by 2022. It represents a significant, but uh, albeit small, relatively small percentage of the total firm capacity, which again, according to Hawaiian Electric for Oahu, was 1,784 megawatts last year. 1,784 megawatts, and the AES plant is 180. So the rough math is that represents about a tenth, right, Jay, about a tenth of total firm capacity. When you look at HECO's oil plants at Kahe and Waiau, those two plants alone, Kahe being 650 megawatts and Waiau being 500, do the math there, 650 plus 500, that is 1,150. Yeah. And then you get Campbell Industrial Park, which is biofuel 120 megawatts, Schofield biodiesel and uh, and diesel 50 megawatts. It is way, way, way more difficult for HECO to conceive of one or more of those oil plants, especially Kahe and Waiau, being converted anytime soon to something other than burning oil because it represents such a significant percentage of the total firm capacity that Hawaiian Electric needs to keep the lights on. I think one thing comes to mind, and I would like your view of this also, is sort of like housing. You want to get in and build a lot of affordable housing. You want to make a new subdivision. You want to, you know, bring in investment and, and provide housing for a state that is in desperate, desperate need of housing. You have to go through the bureaucracy, and it takes a long, long time. You know, Castle and Cook took decades and decades for, you know, each of their projects uh, for these large scale housing projects. And so, I mean, it's, it's kind of a radioactive issue. You know, going in, you're going to run into that. So if I want to do 
um, you know, a, a wind facility or a large utility scale solar facility, I've got to go through the gauntlet. I've got to get all the permits. I've got to you know, go through the EIS. I've got to risk having a protest or a series of protests on my hands. I am going to spend a fortune getting there. Um, and, you know, it won't happen for years. Uh, so, you know, I mean, if I'm any utility, I'm, I'm going to be concerned about these things. And it's got to be, it's got to enter into my calculation about whether it's worthwhile, don't you think? Well, what accounts then, what accounts for one utility company in this state that by next, by this year, by the end of the year, will achieve somewhere over 50% renewables, whereas the other utility companies, Hico, Helco, Miko, will be lucky if they hit 28%. Why is it that one utility company, in this case, Kauai Island Utility Co-op, can make the kind of progress they did in the same time frame that HECO has had to make progress. Why is it that one company can do it and another company has much more difficulty doing so? I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that. I, I don't know if I can give a complete answer, and I can't speak on behalf of uh, either one of them. Um, but it, it, it occurs to me um, that, that Kauai is a much smaller place. It occurs to me that uh, Kauai is a, a co-op where you have a you know, a sort of a public outreach to the members of the co-op, and that helps politically get things through. Uh, it occurs to me that uh, Kauai may have more enlightened management uh, in the government that actually goes along and helps and, you know, supports these projects. Uh, so, that, you know, that, that comes to mind. In, in the case of, um, you know, in the case of Hawaiian Electric, you have three islands. Uh, all of them have a... Five. Thank you. Five, Five Island. Five, Five Island. Uh, you're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, the, mm, three counties. <laughs> and um, you know what? What? What I? What you know? What I would notice is that uh, each one of them has their own bureaucratic, you know, systems. Each one of them has different, you know, different government and managers. Um, that's more difficult. Um, and each one of them has a, a public that may or may not be on the same page, or that may be apathetic. And so I think the political environment and the bureaucratic environment is different between uh, KIUC and Kauai, which has a you know, little wee top, tiny population, uh, and the rest of the state in Hawaiian Electric. I don't know if that fully answers what you've raised, but I think those are considerations that are appropriate. And I think that's, you know, if, if you were in the classroom and you just did uh, that answer as part of your oral exam, I would definitely put you in the B plus, A minus range. So, so well done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I have some comments. I'm a tough grader. I, I have some I'm comments I, I want to make to you <laughs> about that. <laughs> but I will save them for after the show. <laughs> Well, thank you. you know, for what you say is, I don't disagree with what you said, Jay. And at the same time, you know, you can say, well, Hawaiian Electric has five <laughs> islands, and that's much more challenging, and they have, you know, a little bit of a different culture on each of the islands and different utility companies. I mean, Alan Oshima is now going on, five, he'll be five years at the helm of HECO as of October, a couple months from now, right? And one of Alan's big things has been one company, one company, one company, one company. Alan's one company initiative, okay? And uh, Alan, of course, can describe it much better than I can, but that's been one of his main goals is to bring the three, the tri companies together so they're much more integrated. So they're able to not reinvent the wheel, you know, on a per company basis. And, you know, there's some logic behind that. And at the same time, you have these individual grids, Molokai, Lanai, Maui, Big Island, and Oahu. And it, it seems to me that with enlightened leadership, and progressive visions of what needs to be done that incredible progress can be made. But again, one of the challenges, one of the things you didn't mention is the fact that Hawaiian Electric Industries is a publicly owned company, right? They're traded on the New York Stock Exchange. They have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders 
to be able to maximize return on the investment through dividends and through performance. Now, to what extent that is, is conflicting with or, or is challenged by trying to do the best thing for individual island rate pairs, I don't know. That's more of a philosophical discussion. But that is a key difference between in, investor-owned utility companies like Hawaiian Electric and TIUC, which is a co-op, which means that the rate payers are the members and the members are the rate payers. So there's no schism and inherent conflict between rate payers and shareholders. So I happen to believe that that's also something worth noting. And if you had said that in your response, you would have got an A or an A+. plus. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you uh, an A- minus for all your hard work on this issue. And I think, <laughs> I, I think if we... Uh... If we if we can get uh, Alan Oshima down here, he can get an A or an A plus uh, in in addressing the same questions. Marco, very interesting conversation. Very important that we address this because ultimately this is at the core of the initiative. Uh, so Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar and Hilo, uh, joining us for Energy 808, the cutting edge here on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much, Marco. Well, thank you for listening to my meanderings and my machinations. You have patience beyond Buddhahood. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Bye-bye. <laughs>